Good morning, everybody. Good morning. It's good to be in here. It's good to see people inside the church again for a change. Um, we were going to have it outside, but the weather didn't want to cooperate with us today, and we didn't want to take any chances with getting the equipment wet mm -hmm. or ourselves. So anyhow, uh, I'm going to turn it over to Doug. He's going to be our speaker today, and Wendy is going to be our musician. We haven't heard from her in a while, so I'm um, anxious to hear her. So welcome, everybody, and uh, I'm glad to see everybody's got their mask on, and the seating in the chairs are supposed to be sitting in, so follow the rules. Thank you so much for doing that. So anyhow, Doug. Good morning. Oh, it's so nice to see the church with folks here. This is really nice. And if you're watching on the internet, uh, thank you for joining us today. We really, really appreciate having you with us and wor worshiping with us. As you know, sometimes I like to start out uh, kind of in a light way. To, you know, the church is not always so churchy sometimes. And I saw where some women at the church, at a particular church, and they were writing up the, the uh, publication for the coming week. And uh, they had made just a few errors. And, and I'll share just three or four with you. A bean supper will be held on Tuesday evening in the church hall. Music will follow. <laughs> Next Thursday will be tryouts for the choir. They need all the help they can get. <laughs> At the evening service tonight, the topic will be, what is hell? Come early and listen to our choir practice. <laughs> Potluck supper, Sunday at 5. Prayer and medication to follow. <laughs> and here's one I really like. The ladies of the church have cast off clothing of every kind. They may be seen in the basement on Friday afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> and now is the time in our service where we do our Bible verse and often I don't do a Bible verse I do a, a God moment or a God inspiration and it occurred to me this week that H.G. Wells the famous author wrote a classic tale one time called The Time Machine and in it his primary character talked about having a time machine and the primary character said you know we all have a time machine you see, when we go back to the past, that's called memories. When we go to the future, that's called our dreams. One man was going back, and he went back to his old town where he had grown up, and he was walking around his town, and he thought, oh, I was so miserable then. And he remembered maybe being bullied in school, and maybe not making the grades he thought he should, and not being asked to be on the sports teams. And then he became very happy. He thought, you know, I've changed so much since then. You know, memories are good in a way because they help us, teach us a compassion for ourselves. And often we can learn a lot. Don't us, our memories teach us things. You know, I'm not going to do that same mistake twice. Memories and dreams. And sometimes dreams are good for the future. You see, we... Our future is uncertain. And we become, you know, a little afraid of the future sometimes. Our past or our memories act as a foundation for us. And our dreams act as our hope or inspire us for the future. So don't be afraid of your memories, nor of your dreams. Because in this time machine, we all should be living in the present. Thank you. <clears throat> now, to start our service, if you'll look on the board behind me, and we'll say our statement of being. God is all, both invisible and visible, one presence, one mind, one power is all. This one that is all is perfect life, perfect love, and perfect substance. I am the individualized expression of God, and I am ever one with this perfect life, Perfect 
sound quite different. We had a bed and we 
had a house to wake up into. We had shelter. We had food, and we might have food later. Thank you. We get to come to church and be with others of like mind. Thank you. We started our cars and came here. We took another form of transportation. Thank you. We might not have all the money we need for everything, but Father, thank you for what we do have. It somehow is always enough. You meet our needs so frequently. Thank you. Thank you for the peace that is going to come to this world. Thank you for some of the right decisions that are going to be made and will be made by our leaders. We thank you in advance for that. Thank you for the scientists and the disease experts working on a cure for this COVID-19. Thank you for that. Father, there's so much to be thankful for. The sky is blue, the sun is shining. I noticed it rose yesterday, and it again today. Thank you for that promise. Thank you for my health, for your health. Thank you. We'll cast our burdens aside for just a little while, Father. We'll concentrate on the glory that you have given us, all the good that is around us, the friendships, the smiles, even under the mask. I can see the twinkle in the eye, the helping of someone reaching out and helping a neighbor. Thank you. safety you give us. Thank you. In these next 90 seconds, I invite you on your own to talk to Mother, Father, God in your own way, in your own language, in your own mind.
God, thank you for the music that we hear. It even goes through courses through our bodies. Thank you for that. Then we acknowledge the peace you bring to our lives, peace that surpasses all understanding. state law pretty much follow each other. So Smith Mountain Lake is governed under state law. And as such, the boats, if they're under 39.4 inches in length, which takes in most of the boats on Smith Mountain Lake, they have to have a certain lights on them. When they're underway, they have to have a green light and a red light, porch and starboard. And the light has to be visible for 112 degrees for one mile. Now on the stern or the mast, they have to have a white light that is visible for 360 degrees and visible for two miles. I thought, gee, isn't that interesting? 360 degrees for two miles. They really want you to see them. And it made me think of how does God navigate in our lives? Or does He at all? I mean, is God navigating our lives at all? Well, I wanted to, I wanted to just touch on that issue just a little bit with you today. How well, God navigates in our lives. And I could not pick a better illustration than in the second book of the Bible, Exodus. This is where God has chosen Moses. Remember Moses uh, in the burning bush? And God has chosen Moses to lead his people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. And, and Moses said, I'm not, I'm not capable of doing that. I, I can't do that. I can't even speak good. I'm, I have a speech impediment or something. We don't really know. And God said, no, I, I'll tell you what, I'll make your elder brother, Aaron, your spokesperson, you know, Moses must have had that, that thing we call charisma. I don't know what it is or how you get it. I guess you're just born with it. Some people have it. You know who I'm talking about. You've seen the charisma that they have. Moses must have had that, that touch of charisma to allow people to follow him, even though he couldn't speak well. And you remember, Moses kept going to the Pharaoh, let, let's, let my people go. You know, we need to leave. They've been enslaved for 420 years. Let the Israelites go. Oh, no, I can't let you go. You're, you're 
rebuilding my roads and my temples. I can't let you go anywhere. Remember the plagues came. We had nine plagues. And the tenth plague, the final one, where God decreed that every firstborn son in every household, whether the Pharaoh or the handmaiden, the firstborn son would be killed. And the first male animal, whether it be a donkey, a cattle, or a sheep, would be killed. And Moses warned the Israelites, he said, well, put, put lamb's blood on your doorway, and you'll be okay. And they did. And then they woke up the next morning, and Egypt was in such anguish, such gnashing of teeth. The Bible says this would be the worst thing that ever happened to Egypt, and it'll never happen again. The firstborn died everywhere. Firstborn male. And of course, Pharaoh said, Go, go, get out of here, go. And so it says, Moses gathered up the Israelites, 600,000 young war, warrior type or warrior aged men. So I don't know how many men that would be or how many people, because we didn't, we've got to count the women and the children, but we know there were at least 600,000 men. Think about that exodus, a million, two million people. You know, we, we can't even handle Katrina. Think about the exodus. And they had to live quickly. So Moses said, do not even have leavened bread in your house. Do not even have yeast in your house. We're leaving quickly. It was a sign that we're leaving quickly. And we're going to eat unleavened bread for seven days. I have to leave quickly. And so they were leaving. Now here's the part I want to emphasize. Navigation. This just is astounding. If you go to chapter 13, the last sentence or two in that whole chapter, it said, God had a pillar of cloud for the day and a pillar of fire for the night to lead his people. A pillar of cloud and a pillar of fire. So they could continue walking. I thought, oh me. If I saw that, I'd stand on top of a mountaintop scream, look what my God has done. I'd stand on the top of a temple, look what God has done. He's navigating for us. And I want you to know that that pillar of cloud and that pillar of fire did not go away for the entire 40 years until they reached Moab in Deuteronomy or I'm sorry, in Numbers yes God was navigating for these, these Israelites and then it made me think well, what about today? I mean, is God still navigating for us and then I thought, well, does he come when we're like deep into prayer? I mean, where prayer life is, we're deeply and earnestly praying one morning or something. Does God then come and say, yes, this is what you should do, Doug. This is what you should do, Jane. This is what you should do, Jan. I don't think so. Oh, I'm not saying it hasn't happened, but I don't think so. Or does God come when you're deep into the Scriptures, reading and reading and studying? And, and you're asking questions like, should I take this job? Or should I marry this woman? Or should I marry this man? Should I buy this car or this house? I don't think that's how we get the answers. And I don't think that's how God navigates for us. That's not the answer. Though I'm sure it has happened. There was a Methodist pastor living in Virginia. And he heard about a church opening up in California. And I guess he thought, you know, I have a calling. They call it a calling to go teach at this new church. I have a calling. And he's using his prejudices here just a bit. I've always wanted to live in California. I mean, think of the ocean, the 
the sun, and all those different kind of peoples from all over the world. I've always wanted to go there instead of here in Virginia. I'll pray about it. So he said he prayed, he prayed. And of course the prayer came back and said, yeah, you need to go. So he went to California. And he was there about 10 days. He thought, you know, I have made the biggest mistake in my life. I made a horrible mistake. I don't like these people, this church at all, and they don't like me. No, I don't think God knocks us over the head and says, go this way, go that way. And our prejudices do get in our way sometimes. But I do believe God navigates in our lives. I can look back at my life, and I'm sure you can look back at yours, and you can see something unfold. Almost mystical how it unfolded. How things changed and just fell into place. And how it turned out wonderful. I think God does things through circumstances. You know, you can look back and go, wow, I remember I could not even write that script. The Hollywood script wouldn't even be like that. I did not know that was going to happen, but it just fell that way. And it all came together. And it looked out perfect. Now, God was behind that. God was navigating for me. And I didn't even know it. I believe that's how God navigates within our lives. With circumstances. Along that front, and with that thought, God navigating through circumstances. I'm going to take you back to 1955, to Jerome Weidman. Oh, you might know him. Some of you might know him. Jerome Weidman. His father was an immigrant from Germany. His father worked in the, uh, as a tailor or in the garment industry in New York. Jerome grew up in New York. He was a Jewish family. And he worked in the garment industry also. And from there he got a lot of common sense and his ideas for his writing. See, he went to NYC, New York City University, <coughs> New York City College, and got a degree in journalism. Oh, that's not a wonderful university or college. It was, at that time, it was more of a blue-collar kind of school. And he was a blue-collar kind of guy. He was okay. Young guy, and around 20 years old of age, he was invited to this wealthy woman's home. And he said, oh, that would be a good time for me to, to, uh, to meet other people, to broaden my horizons, to do some networking. So he went to the, to the little gala. It was a dinner party. Here in the South, we call it a supper party. He went to the dinner party, and after, after the nice meal, they were all, he noticed they were all sort of being led into a drawing room, a great big drawing room. It was a wealthy lady. And he saw that they were stacking chairs up as if they were going to look at a stage. And he looked, and there, there was indeed a, a platform. And on the platform were some chairs, and he could see there were some musical instruments leaning against them, like a, a cello and a violin and so forth. And he went, oh, mate, we're in for some music. I can't stand music. He's not a musical fellow. <coughs> well, they all had a seat. And they started playing the cello and the violin, and they were playing Bach. And so he did what he always does when he wants to tune things out. He closed his eyes and acted interested, like he was really into the whole thing. And he was just deep into his own thoughts. And after the performance, everybody, you know, lightly clapped, and he heard a voice beside him say, Do you like Bach? And he turned and looked. It was Dr. Albert Einstein looking at him. <laughs> oh, he recognized him. <clears throat> and he thought, you know, he looked deep into this man's eyes and he said, this is not a man you lie to. This is Dr. <laughs> Einstein with that quizzical, wonderful look he's giving me. So he said, no, I, I don't like Bach at all. 
Matter of fact, I don't like music. I'm tone deaf. Albert Einstein gently patted him on the leg and said, Come with me. Come with me. And they got up and they left. And he said, Albert Einstein knew where he was going in this house. He'd been there before. They went up on the second floor into a, a rather large library. And he walked over to a photograph, you know, a record player. And there was a wall full of records and photographs. And Albert Einstein said, what kind of music do you like? And he said, I, I really don't like music at all. He said, what do you listen to? And he said, well, I listen to Bing Crosby sometimes. And Albert Einstein said, oh, okay, okay. And he looked, he looked, he looked, he looked, and he found a Bing Crosby record. And he played a little bit of it for him. And he put it back up, and he said, he got another one out. He played a little bit. He said, sing some of the notes to me. See, he's tone deaf. He said, I, I, I'll try. He was a little embarrassed, of course. This is Dr. Albert Einstein, but you don't turn the man down. So he tried to sing just a few of the notes. And he saw Einstein's eyes go up as he was trying to get an eye note. He thought, he's trying to help me. And then he got another record out. He got John Montano. Oh, I'm sorry, yeah. John McCormick, the trumpeter. And he listened to that. It was getting more complicated and more complicated. And then Dr. Einstein said, you know, if your teacher had come to you and said, all of a sudden, let's do fractions, you could not have done it. You had to start with adding and subtracting first. The same way you start with music, you have to start out small and build up. So they were listening to John McCormick. And then they listened to Caruso, the Italian tenor. And he said, hum some with me. So they hummed together. And then finally he put on box where sheep graze quietly. And they listened to that together. And now uh, Einstein had his pipe and he said, how do you like it now? He said, I feel much better about music now. And then they walked back downstairs. And as they got downstairs, of course, every eye looked at him as they entered back into the room. Here comes Dr. Albert Einstein. And as they took their seat, there was only like one or two more songs and the performances were over. And the hostess got up and sort of icily looked at Jerome and said, I am so sorry, Dr. Einstein, that you missed most of the performance. He said, Dr. Einstein made this difference in his life. Right then, with these ten words. Oh, no, no, no. I opened up another fragment of the frontier of beauty. I opened up yet another fragment of the frontier of beauty for this man. He said, just hearing those words from this man changed my life forever. Now to finish Jerome Weidman's story, he was a playwright, a screenwriter, and in 1960, this tone-deaf man wrote the book for the musical for Barbara Streisand, and he won a Pulitzer Prize. circumstances, navigation. God working in our lives where we would not have expected it to show us the beauty in life. Let's point something else out. I was looking for other instances of, of, <coughs> of circumstances and navigation. And it took me to Acts, Acts 16 to be exact. This is where Paul and Silas had gone to Philippi for their second time, their second missionary visit. Now, who was Silas? Well, he was sort of like the, the cohort, the tag along for Paul, sort of like Johnny Carson and Ed McMahon. 
So Paul and Silas had come to Philippi. And of course you can't keep Paul quiet. He's preaching everywhere. And he meets a lady named Lydia. Lydia is a wealthy family. She, uh, she trades in purple cloth that's worn by royalty. She has quite a bit of money. Matter of fact, well, I'll get to her in a minute. Paul and Silas are, are spreading this new gospel, spreading what Jesus had taught, you know, love, love your neighbor. There aren't many Jews living in Philippi, so there, it didn't fall on very opened ears. And there was a woman there who evidently was like a prophet of some sort. And she would go before him going, look out, here comes Paul and Silas. And one day he turned to her and said, Spirit, get out of her. And when he did, she, she could no longer foretell the future. And so her owners became very angry at Paul and Silas and threw them in jail. So Paul and Silas are sitting in jail. And in the evening hours, the darkness came. A great earthquake came and shook everything. The door to the sail flew open, and the cuffs they had on their hands even flew off their hands. Now wait. I'm going to say that that is sort of a, an inspiration or a happening because I think what really happened after this is Paul and Silas talked even more openly. They were not held back or bound by anything at that point. There were no more cuffs on them. There were not any more jail cells in front of them. They spoke their truth to the people, people, this spiritual truth. Matter of fact, the jailer even invited them to their house where he heard about God, heard about the teachings of Jesus, the master teacher, and turned from his ways. And Lydia, she became the first person in all of Europe to turn to Christianity. Even today, just known as the first person ever to turn to Christianity. You see, the circumstance put Salus, Paul and Salus there. As they were navigating their way and speaking the truth to the people of Philippi. Yeah, I believe that's how it's done. I believe it's done through circumstances and I do believe God does navigate. About seven or ten days ago, Oh, you know what's going on. You read the news and see the, see the TV. About seven or ten days ago, in Whitefish, Montana, which is about 50, 60 miles south of the Canadian border, it's a small little town, 8,000 people, 97% white. Samantha Francine grew up in that area. She's biracial. And she got caught up in this movement that's going on, Black Lives Matter. And so she made a little sign that says, say their names. And she went out on the street in this small little town with two or three others. There weren't many there that would go protest, but she wanted to protest. She's 27 years old. With her little sign saying, say their names. And as she was standing there with her mask on, Jay Snowden, 51 years old, came up to her. Now she is about 5 feet tall, 5'1". Looks like she weighs like 115, 118. Jay, 51 years old, is a, of course a white male. He's about 6'1", 6'2". Looks like he weighs about 230, 235, big guy. And he was so irate. 
just cussing profanity one after the other after the other at her and he got within inches of her face. He's not wearing a mask, she is. And she's so afraid of this man. She's terrified. And then it occurred to her that 16 years earlier, her father, who's been dead for 16 years, and she's just 27, he told her one time, always look them in the eyes. Always look them in the eyes. <clears throat> no matter what the situation or who it is, always look them in the eyes. And she said as she was standing there, she thought of what her father had said 16 years prior. And this man, standing inches from her face, angry, upset, belligerent, and she stood there and stared at him. Just stared at him. Someone took a picture of him. It was a steering off contest. She's staring at him, and he's mouth open, just full of rage. And she simply stood her ground. And she said a peace came over her. She knew she was going to be all right at that point. She just stood there and stared at him. And he went on. Later he was arrested for disorderly conduct. And later she took a, a gift basket to his wife. circumstances. God is navigating in your life and my life even now. I want you to know as we go forward in these days, that pillar of cloud and that pillar of fire still is with us. We are never alone God is omnipresent. Will you go within with me now? Oh God, thank you so much, Father, Mother, God, for, for the knowledge that we feel, we know, that you light our way by night and guide us during the day. <clears throat> Father, I can steer down anything in front of me because I know you are with me. That peace that we talked about earlier, that peace that surpasses all understanding, goes forward with us, even today. Thank you, dear God. Amen. <clears throat> Try a song here that was uh sorry. This was uh, a very old Irish hymn written in the tenth century and then I think uh translated uh around nineteen hundred and I just came across it a week ago or so, and it really moved me. And it's got very old-fashioned words, but it really spoke to me. So. Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart, not be Waking or sleeping, thy presence 
my life. Be thou my wisdom and thou my true word. I am with thee and thou with me, Lord. Thou my great Father and not our true Son. Thou Riches I heed not, nor man's empty praise. Thou my inheritance now and always. Thou and only, first in my heart. I keep. King of heaven, my victory is won. May I reach heaven's joy on the bright heaven's sun. Heart of my own heart, whatever befall, still be my vision, O ruler of all. Now's the time in our service where we, we get to give back some. We give our, our talents also to the church. We give our time also. Sometimes we have to give money too. It keeps the church functioning. If you would, say the blessings of the gift with me right now. Today, I acknowledge God, omnipresent, as the source of all good, as the source of my good. With this acknowledgement, I accept His will which is abundant in every aspect of my life. I release all thoughts of lack of limitation, and I am open and receptive to these secrets. I joyfully accept the gifts of life and give freely the special gift that I am. Through me, God omnipresent, blesses and multiplies this gift for all. Thank you. Well, as you know, we have a shortened service, so we're going to have a, our closing benediction now. If you'll close your eyes with me. Yes? Announcement? Oh, I'm sorry. Come here. It's okay. We're learning as we go. Our new format here. So, uh, just want to announce that, uh, first off, the flowers today are, are beautiful. They're sponsored by Rick and memory of his mother. Thank you, Rick. Appreciate you. Uh, I also want to thank Lisa for her help yesterday with helping uh, paint off this bank over there. And so she helped to do that. Did, did the biggest part of it, actually. So thank you very much for coming in and working the whole time you're here. So thank you. Um, also, some new rules and guidance as we go along. And this will go until we'll keep this going until they tell us otherwise. So when you come to church, you come in the front door. When you leave, please go out the side door. Um, we're not passing the uh, blessing basket, but Laurel will be standing up here holding the basket uh, if you want to make donations. Also, she will be holding the prayer basket. The prayer basket is pretty full because uh, we've got lots of people that need prayer, and with nobody being here, 
no slips haven't been picked up, so feel free to pick up more than one, but Laurel will be standing up here as we leave for both of those things. So we ask that you exit through the side door, even if you go to the annex for coffee or and snacks, and we have those over there available, uh, please come back and annex, uh, go through the annex door, to, I mean, the side door to leave. Um, that makes things a lot easier for us when we have to clean, clean up. And as you can tell, the chairs are going all different directions, and hopefully we'll have those, we'll be able to switch those back hopefully by the end of the year. So, but we are dealing, we are dealing along with what we have to do and we'll wait for the governor's and the CDC's, CDC's directions as we go forth. And so I uh, just appreciate everybody that shows up and everybody that continues to support us. And uh, Marita, did you have anything that you wanted to say? Or Doug, Melanie, Basket? Our friend Melanie is not feeling well. We ask that you continue to keep her in prayer. She's having some uh, health issues. So we pray that you continue to get better. Uh, also, uh, Pam has started back her journaling class. It will start uh, Tuesday night at 6.30. Um, we went back to coffee Wednesday night. We started uh, going back and we said, uh, we went outside instead of inside to slowly get back into to doing things. So uh, slowly people are getting back to doing uh, some things, but we ask that you be cautious and careful and follow the guidelines and wear the mask and do everything you're supposed to do and we will all be fine and we will continue to get through this together. So uh, again, thank you for all the support and all that it's been long, three months or whatever since March. It seems like yesterday was Christmas and it just, we've skipped like half a year. So anyhow, I um, hope to see you next Sunday. We, we plan to have it outside, depending on the weather. I apologize to the people from last week that could not hear we were having, we thought the speakers would work from in here, but they were loud in here, but they were not loud outside. So uh, we will work on that this coming week um, and see what I can do to correct that problem. Uh, also, uh, the background noise as far as uh, the car noise and all that, there's not a lot we can do about that. But if I get the speakers to work, and hopefully the speakers will. Y'all can speak up loud enough so that you can outdo McDonald's over here. So, so I apologize for that. But we're, it's a lesson we're learning as we go along. Lots, lots of things we have to do differently. So. Uh, and uh, our staying here, uh, we appreciate Bob uh, Dieter. He made a, he put a lot of effort into it and uh, for our singers to be in front of. Uh, so we really appreciate him doing that. It is uh, one of the things that they recommended that we do. So anyhow, it's all falling into place and uh, uh, we glad to see you here this morning, Kate. So uh, anyhow, um, that will turn it over to you. Uh, the other thing is when we have our closing prayer, as we used to do, we used to do a circle and hold hands. That is no longer, not going doing that for, for a while. So. Uh, we'll do what we have to do. Thank you for the wonderful message. If you want, as a congregation, to close your eyes now, become comfortable where we're sitting. And those at home, please, you're, please join us. Don't leave us yet. This is an important time. It's, it's time we share with Mother, Father, God. Oh, Father, we come to you, and we, we heard the song say, you are worth more than gold and silver, and oh, indeed you are. I hope we had a, a service that lifted a heart, touched a heart, eased a burden. Thank you, Father, for working in our lives, for, for navigating still, for the circumstances as they unfold. We'll look back and go, I did not see that happening. I am so thankful. As we each step forward this week, we step forward knowing that God is omnipresent, knowing that the pillar of fire, the pillar of light goes before us. We are comforted. And it is so. Amen. Amen. Thank you.